Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This project has received funding from the European Union and Carleton University. The views expressed in this video do not reflect those of the European Union or the Center for European Studies. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the CETA webinar. Uh, my name is Tina Bijou, and I'm a professor in the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. Uh, and I'm also the academic coordinator for the Center for European Studies here at Carlton. Um, before we get started, I, I would like to ask you, in case you have problems hearing, uh, let us know on, uh, on the public forum, um, because it, it is quite of a new experience for us uh, too, so uh, any feedback would be uh, great. Um, the, the discussion for today will be focused on um, Canada-EU relations and mainly on the uh, Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement that was signed in uh, September of 2014. Um, now, uh, I just want to mention that this uh, presentation discussion is uh, mainly geared towards uh, educating a general audience. So it is not uh, an academic talk. It is uh, mainly my point of view in terms of uh, what were the main achievements and possible uh, issues uh, regarding the, the newly concluded uh, agreement between Canada and the EU. Having said that, uh, the way I structure uh, my presentation is I'll give you a very brief introduction about the EU and Canada as trade players. Um, I will uh, briefly mention the, their uh, relations and, of course, the main uh, topic and uh, most of the time will be focused on CETA and what I consider to be uh, the main achievements and uh, possible issues from now on. So, um, looking at EU, EU is uh, the largest trading power, uh, so there is no surprise that uh, Canada has been uh, interested in uh, signing a trade agreement with the EU for a long time. As you can see here, EU is, uh, um, holds 15% of the world trading goods, uh, is the largest importer, largest exporter of the world, and also is the largest receiver also of investment and also the, the largest investor. Um, if we look at, at services, we can see the same kind of pictures. Uh, EU holds 25% of the mar global market share in terms of uh, services exports. Um, and it's by far the first in the world, uh, followed by the U.S., um, um, but still uh, it is the, the, most, uh, the most important. Now, um, going on, uh, the 10 major EU export partners, uh, first uh, is the U.S., um, and after followed by China and Switzerland, as you can see here, the reason I, I'm, I'm showing you that is just to, to show where the relationship are focused when we look at, at the EU and, and Canada. We see that Canada is not among uh, the first uh, 10 uh, exporters, export partners for the European Union. If you look at the 10 major import partners for the EU, uh, we see that uh, U.S. is on the third place, and this happened since 2010 when China and Russia have uh, un undertaken U.S. in terms of uh, partners for, for imports. So, again, Canada is not among the, the first 10 uh, importer uh, partners for, for the European Union. Um, in terms of investments, though, uh, by far the U.S. is the, the major uh, partner for the European Union. Uh, but we see Canada being on the fourth place. So uh, investment plays an important role in explaining the, the relation between the, uh, Canada and the U.S., as we'll see uh, in a moment. On the other hand, by looking at Canada, this is probably no surprise for anybody. Um, the main trading partner for Canada is, is the U.S., uh, regardless if we look at, at the exports or imports, and this is by far uh, compared to the other trading partners. Uh, even the European Union holds the second place. It's uh, still uh, explaining a very small share of, of Canadian export destination uh, compared to the to the U.S. Uh, if we look at the import, we see a kind of a similar picture: U.S. being on the first place, um, followed by China and immediately after by by the European Union. So one of the reasons for which Canada is looking to um, 
to have stronger relations with, with the European Union and other countries is in a way to diversify its, its trade and not to be so highly dependent on the uh, US market. Um, so by looking at EU Canada in 2013, Canada has been the 12th most important trading partner for the EU uh, with 1.7% of EU external trading goods, uh, while the EU uh, was the second most important trading partner for Canada with 9.8% of Canada external trading goods. So uh, the trade patterns are not very important if you want to say it, uh, if you, if you want to consider it that way. Um, and that was one of the reasons for trying to negotiate an agreement that will increase this uh, or will transform this relation into a much more important one. However, they are important trading partners in services and also they are important partners in investments, as has been seen. EU is Canada's fourth uh, largest source and destination um, of investment. Um, now, moving on, uh, in terms of processes, um, the European Union has shifted its, uh, its trade policy in 2006 um, through the Global Europe Strategy. Uh, and one of the main topics of this uh, new policy was uh, the conclusion of new generation of trade agreements. The reason I'm, I'm pointing out this is because Canada was one of the first uh, countries that uh, was uh, invited to start negotiation with under this new uh, trade policy. Uh, later on in 2010, uh, Europe 2020 has clearly uh, mentioned the completion of this uh, uh, new generation of trade agreements as being one of the important factors that will help the European Union uh, deal with the outcomes of the latest economic crisis. Uh, so as a result of this new um, shift in the trade policy, the European Union has started uh, um, uh, negotiating with a number of countries um, and we see the agreements that are enforced, the, the ones for which the negotiations are concluded to recognize they did not update these uh, pictures as Canada is not uh, here yet, but it's on the following one where it shows uh, which negotiations are ongoing and which ones are under consideration. So we see that the EU is focusing on, on uh, uh, on closing these uh, comprehensive agreements with a number of countries or regions, uh, with a number of important trade partners, and probably the one that is most uh, highly debated now in the media is uh, Canada, US, uh, sorry, European Union, US uh, uh, negotiations for a transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership. Um, and But we can see that at the same time, the European Union is negotiating with India, with Japan, uh, with Mercosur and so on. So, um, so from 2006, the European Union has this new policy of, uh, uh, of negotiating a large number of regional and bilateral agreements, uh, which are more than normal free trade agreements. Uh, that's why they are called new generation of trade agreements, because as we'll see in a moment, these agreements include pretty much every aspect of the economy, uh, and it's not, they are not only about border tariffs or border uh, barriers, but it's about non-tariff barrier, investment, services, intellectual property rights, and so on. Um, in terms of, uh, of uh, trade uh, policy, the, here it's a bit different. And why I mentioned this is because the institutional framework is because this is one of the issues that is highly debated now in the media, even after CETA has been concluded, what is the process of implementation and what is the process of ratification of this uh, uh, concluded agreement in the European Union. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll briefly mention a bit more about that in my conclusion, but as an institutional framework, uh, the way it works, the EU, the EU trade negotiation is run by the European Commission. However, once um, uh, um, agreement is concluded, such as CETA, um, the two uh, uh, executive member, the two executive uh, committees, the Council um, and the Parliament, have to approve and ratify the, uh, the agreement. And after that, it's the agreement is a mixed agreement, meaning including some issues that are still under the sovereignty of member states. Then each twenty, each of the twenty-eight member states have to ratify certain parts of the agreement. So I will, I will mention about that more in, in my conclusion, any, 
as it is portrayed right now in the media as a possible issue uh, moving forward with, with this agreement. Um, uh, if you look at Canada, it's, the process is much easier. Uh, the trade policy is run only by the federal government. And in fact, um, this was the first trade agreement where the provinces were invited at the negotiating table. And this is because of the EU insistence on having provinces at the, at the table due to certain issues that are under provincial and even uh, more local um, power. Um, however, there is no uh, question of ratification by provinces. This once the, the federal government is, is signing and concluding the, the agreement, uh, if the provinces will, will have to implement it. So we see the same kind of picture when we look at the Canadian negotiation under Canada's global commerce strategy and the action plan. Um, we, we see Canada negotiating with a number of countries. I, I uh, listed here a, a few of them. There are already nine free trade agreements in force. One free trade agreement signed, the South Korea, uh, the one concluded with the EU, and 11 free trade agreements under negotiation. And I mentioned just uh, what I consider to be the most important with uh, Trans Trans-Pacific Partnership, also Japan and India. So we see the same kind of spread uh, that we we could uh, we, we discuss about in terms of the European Union uh, and the interest interest uh, all over the world. So um, now moving closer to to our topic, EU Canada relation. It was first uh, institutional institutionalized in 1976, the bilateral framework agreement for commercial and economic cooperation. However, it was quite limited not go very far and after that we see more bilateral agreements focus on different sectors um, we see uh, more agreements between let's say different provinces and member states but not something inclusive the only trial was in 2005 so the negotiation on a trade and investment enhancement agreement however the negotiations were stopped in 2006 due to the fact that the european union was insisting in the participation of provinces uh, as again, some of the issues were under uh, discussed were under province uh, power, provinces power. However, the federal government at the time did not agree with this uh, uh, with this uh, setup. So um, this, these are the relationships up to now. In September 20, 26th of September 2014, uh, during Canada EU summit in Ottawa, they announced the conclusion of negotiations for Canada EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. And also the conclusion of negotiations for Canada EU strategic partnership agreement, which is practically more of a political agreement focusing on a strategic direction where the two, can, the two parties can move towards. And they also mention uh, different common interests like security, energy, and so on. Um, so uh, before uh, the negotiation have started, the negotiation was launched in May 2009. Uh, it was quite surprising that they lasted so much, so long, as it was envisioned that they will be done in uh, maximum two years. However, they lasted for five years. Uh, before the negotiations were launched, the federal government, together with the European Commission, has run a joint study where, which assessed the costs and benefits of a closer EU-Canada economic partnership, and they, the numbers that they came up with was that if the uh, negotiations are successful, the EU uh, gross domestic product will increase by 0.08%, while the Canadian GDP will increase, increase by 0.77%. And this is from where the media uh, has taken the 12 billion that was clearly mentioned uh, with any occasion possible. Uh, even though it's, uh, I, I personally, I do have some questions regarding the, the way this study has run, has been run and the assumptions that were used in the study. It's the only comprehensive study that uh, we have up to now that will give us some kind of um, uh, quantification of possible benefits of this agreement. This is the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it uh, right now. So uh, comprehensive, uh, the scope of the agreement, as I mentioned, it's very different than uh, compared to a normal free trade agreement. It includes from uh, trading with regulatory measures, custom procedures, trading services, uh, investment, um, issues uh, of government procurement, regulatory cooperation, intellectual property rights, uh, different institutional arrangements and dispute settlements, uh, sustainable development, and so on. So we see that it's extremely, extremely complex and comprehensive. In fact, 
at the beginning of negotiations, it was um, the talk was about the fact that uh, everything is on the table, which was quite surprising, especially for some issues that are clearly conflictual between EU and Canada for a very long period of time. Um, but the negotiators from both sides have always mentioned that everything is on the table, everything is under discussion, nothing is left out. So it was uh, pretty comprehensive and, of course, very ambitious from the beginning. Uh, the question, or, of course, was always uh, from those ambitions how much it can be achieved. And now uh, I will I will mention uh, what I consider to be the main achievements. Of course, with some questions I have regarding the implementation implementation of this agreement, um, and uh, to see how we move forward from here. So. Tariffs. Uh, if you focus on tariffs, uh, looking at industrial goods, uh, yes, it's impressive. Almost 100% of tariffs are uh, down to zero entry into force of this agreement. However, we have to keep in mind that industrial tariffs are already at very low levels uh, due to uh, multilateral negotiations under uh, under the WTO. So uh, the major benefits are not necessarily coming out from, from the elimination of tariffs for, for industrial goods. Uh, there are different uh, uh, rules for autos. Uh, this is because of the highly integrated market, so the Canadian, the US market, and there are uh, certain rules that they were negotiating in terms of rules of origin. Um, what I find a bit surprising, uh, positively su surprising, is the achievements in agricultural goods. Uh, why I mention that is because at least for the last two years of negotiation, uh, the way these negotiations were portrayed by, by the debate, uh, the public debate in the media, was that the negotiations are stalled, they will not be able to come up with a successful outcome because of beef versus cheese. So practically these negotiations, as we've seen a highly comprehensive agreement, were reduced to the idea that um, we cannot achieve, we cannot go anywhere because the European Union does not open up its beef market, while Canada does not open up its cheese market. And these are very highly sensitive products, and highly uh, um, the parties are highly interested in this sector. So again, the debate was quite reduced to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, topic, beef uh, versus cheese, uh, which even in Canada it can have some kind of political implications, as we know beef uh, is mainly uh, coming from, from Alberta, while cheese is coming from Quebec. So as provinces were, were at the table of negotiations, it obviously created some uh, heated discussion. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that the results in agricultural goods are positively surprising. Um, we see tariffs decreasing um, more in the EU than in Canada. However, in terms of the highly protected beef market in the EU, um, EU has increased its uh, duty-free quota for free, and this is something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, EU is still not open to accepting um, hormone beef. Uh, it increased its quota for beef from around 15,000 to 50,000. So this is pretty much giving enough incentives to Canadian producers to grow uh, beef without hormones, so to develop that part of the industry. Um, for pork, the same, they increased the quota from around 6,000 tons to 81 tons, uh, 81,000 tons. So quite a, a significant increase. For Canada, of course, the, uh, the main uh, sensitive products were the ones under supply management. Poultry and eggs were excluded from negotiation. However, for cheese, Canada has given a 16,000 tons new market access for the European cheeses, which was quite impressive uh, in exchange for any kind of costs that cheese producers will face uh, as this new opening, the federal government has promised to, uh, to, to cover the adjustment costs and to uh, help farmers, uh, producer, cheese producers to pass through this transitional period. So for me, I think from the tariffs perspective, uh, probably the, the agricultural achievements, the achievements in the agricultural sector were, uh, uh, were uh, quite uh, impressive. Um, if we move forward, uh, services and investment, um, well, again, they are both based on the idea that uh, uh, non-discrimination, so it doesn't matter if it's a service provider from, uh, from the EU or a service provider for Canada going in, into the uh, EU, for investment the same. 
Uh, however, uh, they use a negative list, meaning that the, the, the services that are listed on, on this negative list will not uh, be negotiated and are not taken into account. And uh, most of the social services are included in this uh, negative list. Um, now, labor mobility, uh, they, the process of recognizing professional qualification is streamlined, so they clearly establish what are the steps that have to be followed uh, to recognize uh, uh, professional qualification on both sides, and they also minimize barriers to temporary entry, and this was quite ambitious due to the fact that um, um, they they clearly reduce the barriers to temporary entry and also they increase the number of uh, categories of people that are included under this uh, this category here um well my problem with these achievements and they are clearly you know they they went pretty far compared to other uh, trade agreements my problem is that we know that uh in canada there are interprovincial barriers to service movements to um, um, recognition of professional qualification. Uh, the EU, even though is implementing these are parts of the single market, there are certain reports from the European Union which do recognize that the single market is moving quite slow in terms of the, the single market implementation is moving quite slow in terms of, of services and uh, uh, professional uh, qualification recognition. So there are still uh, certain barriers they're moving from one member state to another. So the question that I have in mind, and I, I'm wondering how this will be implemented, will this force, for example, Canada to reduce the interprovincial barriers to move on the services, to move on the people, uh, given their professional qualification, or how will that uh, move along? And I assume this is a, a question that we'll have to follow and see how, how things are, uh, are moving on. The same for, for the European Union. Uh, moving into the investment, we have the same kind of idea, as I mentioned, no discrimination. Uh, uh, the invest Canadian Investor Act is still in place. Uh, so the, the only thing I'll mention here um, is the investor state dispute settlement, uh, because it is a highly contentious issue. It's still the issue that uh, it's uh, right now talked about in the media, even after the conclusion of the um, of the um, negotiation. Uh, why is that? It's because it's seen by certain countries as a way for multinationals of uh, going against governments, uh, not in domestic courts, but in these arbitration tribunals. Uh, so practically, it is portrayed as um, multinationals get, getting much more power um, uh, than before. Uh, however, the way it is described uh, in, the, in the final agreement, it is that they, they do have clear protect, protection standards, uh, clear rules of, on conduct, uh, they, it's a transparent process, and they define what does it mean uh, a breach of the fair and equitable treatment obligation. Now, uh, to be honest, I, I'm quite critical of uh, when reading the, the media, especially, and especially, and when I see uh, people coming out either criticizing or being pro this investor state dispute settlement. And why I'm saying that is because uh, I'm not a lawyer. And this is something that uh, only a lawyer would be able to uh, clearly identify whether or not this investor state dispute settlement is really giving more power to multinational, is going against constitution of certain uh, countries. So that's why I, the only point I'd make here is just be careful when, when you look uh, for, for the debate out there, who in fact is involved in the debate, because it's quite difficult to understand the details of, of uh, this kind of regulations. And uh, that's why I'm saying that le uh, leaving uh, lawyers to deal with these issues probably is, is the best way to do. However, I would mention that this investor state dispute settlement become a point of uh, contention and discussion only when uh, uh, the negotiation between the EU and the US have started on a similar investor settlement. So then you, you would see uh, Germany coming out and saying that they would, uh, would not sign, they would not be able to, to agree with such a, a dispute settlement uh, or some kind of changes have to be made, mainly not necessarily because of Canada, but the implication that they think will have uh, if, uh, the same model is implemented for, uh, for the US. Um, 
Moving on, uh, other achievements, government procurement. Uh, so they open up all levels, the central, sub-central, local governments. Uh, they use the same negative list. So most of the um, uh, social and, and cultural uh, uh, sectors are, are not included, are not open for foreigners. Also, the food programs that are under uh, local governments are not included. So the, the list of sectors um, that are not included in this uh, negotiation for Canada is much longer than for the European Union. This is certainly something that they, the Canada should take advantage of, given the, uh, the importance of government procurement and the size of, of the European market. For the intellectual property rights, uh, there are two major contentious issues, one related to pharmaceuticals, and this is practically what has been decided that uh, that uh, there will be an additional protection for pharmaceutical products, uh, not more than two years. So meaning that the generics will not be able to be sold uh, for additional. Uh, this was contentious due to the fact that the industry has calculated the increasing costs due to uh, this uh, increasing protection, a uh, cost for consumers too. So the federal government has promised to cover any kind of incremental cost impacts. Um, the media has calculated this cost of being around $900 million, but the impact will be uh, felt only by 2023. Uh, the other uh, contentious issue, which is uh, it's closer to my heart, is regarding the geographical indicators. If you are not familiar with the concept, uh, I'll give you an example of GI, from, let's say Champagne. What does it mean is that, uh, yes, uh, any country can produce champagne, it's just they cannot call it champagne, and only champagne from the region of champagne can be paid uh, due to the certain uh, qualities that are in the land, in the water, in the human uh, capital, human skills, and so on. Uh, EU is a big promoter of GIs, and in fact, uh, the wine and spirits uh, GIs of the European Union have been recognized by Canada earlier on in the wine and spirits agreement. However, right now, there, there are for discussions uh, the GIs uh, on uh, food and beer products. And um, the, chief, the, the negotiations here, I mean, uh, we, we didn't know where they will go as, we, as the European Union has uh, clearly mentioned from the beginning that this is a very important issue for the European Union and uh, they will not back out of it. And Canada, on the other hand, having a trademark system uh, and also US having a trademark system was kind in the middle and it, we didn't know what to expect. However, the, the outcome uh, pretty much, uh, uh, it's, it's a middle way. Uh, both sides probably are happy with the outcome. They, uh, the validity of Canadian trademarks are kept. Uh, they, are, they have the ability to use specified uh, English and French language terms commonly employed. There are limited GI rights on, on certain cheeses. Uh, however, this is to apply only to future users, not to the current producers. And they still you can use these names, but only they have to be accompanied by expressions such as kind, type, style, limitation, and so on. And of course, I would just mentioned state-to-state -state dispute settlement just because uh, this is something that uh, most of the free trade agreements include now and this is uh, you know it's practically shortening the process if uh, a conflictual situation uh, will, will appear um i will uh, i will close by uh, in in a couple of minutes uh, i would mention one most of the major benefits were estimated to come out from a regulatory cooperation between the two sides, uh, what is it's named the non-tariff barriers, uh, where they achieved, what they achieved here is practically having more bilateral discussion, more cooperation, creating more uh, uh, forums for discussions. One, uh, in my opinion, important achievement is the creation of outside bodies to conduct assessments on product standards, which will clearly reduce uh, the cost for the industry as before, they had to, the product standards had to be assessed by both sides now, uh, if it's an independent body that, uh, you know, that, that does that kind of assessment, assessment and parties have to accept decisions. Um, and uh, so, more cooperation in, uh, in sectors regulations. Uh, nothing is, everything is on a voluntary basis, for example, even in motor vehicle regulations international standards uh, 
uh, you know, it's better to be used, but again, this is on a voluntary basis. Canada already has implemented a number of the UN auto standards, so uh, they said that they will eventually in time uh, take on the other uh, product standards. So I would say here substantial progress by establishing various international institutional channels through which sector-specific non-tariff barriers can be addressed over time. And why I'm saying that is because one of my one of my personal research interests is, for example, on genetically modified products and going from a situation where there is no discussion, where there is always a conflict, moving to a situation where there is there is more cooperation, there are more uh, institutional frameworks under which they can discuss and educate each other. Let's say I, I think it's a, it's a substantial progress. I'm not sure how far in that sector they can move on, but even this step, uh, it seems to me that it's quite important. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that I will end these possible issues. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether there are issues, but there are things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, from, and this is, again, my personal opinion. When we look at this uh, agreement, first of all, we don't have to forget one thing, uh, that Canada is a small player, and Canada is kind of in the middle between the US and the EU. Canada has already uh, has an important trade agreement with, with the US and Mexico, NAFTA, and now they close down an important agreement with the European Union. So US and the EU, the largest trading power, the largest economic powers of the world. So again, when we look at the negotiations outcome, we have to keep in mind that Canada was quite constrained about how much they can negotiate with the European Union, as they already had certain uh, uh, things in place that were agreed with the US much earlier on. And also the US is its, its largest trading partner. So you don't want to uh, lose or go against certain uh, rules that were established uh, in NAFTA. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. And uh, when, if we are not happy with certain uh, with certain outcomes, uh, we have to think: okay, what is what is the U.S. position, and uh, how what Canada had to do uh, in order to to keep the relation moving. Also, Canada is highly described as the major winner of this trade deal, just because the European Union is a much larger market uh, that now it's open to Canadian investment, to Canadian services, and so on. Well, my question is, can the benefits be taken for granted? And here, from my opinion, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, we do not have to expect that the benefits will just come to us, and government and businesses have to be able to, to invest more in, in technologies, have to be able to uh, find niche markets where we are able to compete in such a large and competitive market as the European Union. Unfortunately, Canada is moving towards, and it is considered to be a resource-based economy. We lack uh, in terms of productivity compared to other countries. So if there is no other steps that are taken further, uh, the benefits will not, be, will not come. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mentioning that there are further steps that, you, uh, that have to be taken. And, by concluding this agreement, uh, we cannot say that everything is, is over. Uh, and I will end with the ratification process because I promise about that. That is something that it is in the media right now. Uh, will this agreement be approved only by EU institution or the EU member states have to ratify certain parts? This, is, uh, this will have to be decided by the European Court of Justice, whether certain investment provi provisions are still under the member states power. Uh, in fact, the European Union has concluded uh, a much smaller agreement with Singapore, and right now the European Court of Justice is deciding whether or not that agreement will have to be ratified uh, by the member states, or at least part of that agreement should be ratified by member states. The conclusion of uh, uh, or the outcome of, of the, the decision of the European Court of Justice regarding using Singapore at all be applied to all the others. Uh, agreement that the European Union uh, is concluding now or has concluded afterwards. So we'll wait and see what is the, uh, the decision there. However, in case the member states have to uh, ratify certain parts of the agreement, then the ratification might take longer, of course. Uh, the Canada and the EU can implement uh, the parts of the agreement that are not under member state ratification. Uh, on a provisional basis, and once the, ratific once the ratification process ends, they can implement eventually uh, the other parts if they are ratified. 
So I will end here to have some uh, some time for discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your question. I will uh, read the question. Um, uh, so it, good morning. It was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. My question would be, what do you think it would be the impact of CETA on the, on, uh, the SME sector in Canada? Uh, namely, while helping this innovation and internationalization. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I'll be quite brief on that because um, this is quite related to what, uh, what my, one of my conclusions and possible issues. Um, it's, it's about innovation. Uh, it's about getting, becoming better. It's about being able to compete on such a large market and quite competitive market. So um, we can, uh, we can have benefits, however, changes have to be implemented. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that we can uh, necessarily say right now what, uh, what will happen because we don't know how it will be implemented and what will be the steps taken by the businesses and so on, uh, and how much the, the government will try uh, to help the businesses and will try to, to invest uh, in, uh, in R&D and technology. Uh, but this is something that has to be keep in mind, and this is something that I always say when I'm asked about CETA, we have to be better. But continuing the way we, we did it up to now will not necessarily uh, help the Canadian businesses. Either here, when we'll start competing with European uh, businesses, either uh, start trying to invest in, uh, uh, in the European again. I'm, on, I'm wondering about how CETA relates to environmental issues for the two sides. There has been some friction in this area. I'm thinking of the controversy over the treatment of oil from the tar sand in the EU fuel quality directive. Were issues regarding different environmental policies and regulations a topic in negotiation? Might they be a problem moving forward? Yes, that's a, thank you for the question. Uh, that's a question that was in everybody's mind uh, before the agreement uh, has been made public, there are quite a, a, a lot of debate out there. Oh, if uh, uh, the European Union will, will impose its environmental standards on Canada, or what, uh, what will happen? In fact, there is a, a chapter on environment included in the in the agreement. Uh, but it again, from that perspective, everything is on a vol voluntary basis. And I think I, in one of my slides, when I talk about regulatory cooperation, it was clearly mentioned that both sides will be able to choose their level of uh, um, level of environmental safety, health safety, and so on. So there is no intrusion from the other side. There is nothing that has been uh, decided, uh, you know, in this agreement. Again, more cooperation in the future, more discussion more education from both sides eventually, uh, you know, uh, but right now environmental policy is not affected uh, in Canada or in the EU. Another question, do you think EU may not ratify the agreement until after an agreement between federal government and Newfoundland over fish fund is reached? Um, how do you think the conflict of the, over the fish fund will be resolved? Well, I don't think that the EU in the ratification process will necessarily take into account what uh, the situation in Canada. The EU has to deal with its uh, um, member states if the, 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 the agreement goes uh, for ratification at the member states level. Um, now, once the federal government has concluded the agreement, it was kind of an assumption because that the provinces were on, on board with that. Uh, and the provinces, that's why the provinces were invited at the negotiating table, and that's why the government, the federal government, has made its promise to uh, help uh, uh, the industries that are, will be affected uh, uh, by this, uh, this opening of, um, of um, um, that, are, that are taking place in, uh, during this, uh, once this agreement is being implemented. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, it, I'm not necessarily familiar where, where is the discussion right now between the federal government and the Newfoundland government regarding the fish fund. Uh, however, this was clearly a contentious issue during the negotiations of how the, uh, the um, uh, fish uh, and the seafood market will be uh, affected in, uh, in, uh, in that area. 
However, after uh, some more negotiation and, and certain conditions that were uh, put in the agreement, uh, in my opinion, I, I at least I thought that the, the issue was quite quite solved, and the provinces uh, have uh, uh, agreed with uh, the conclusion of the agreement. Uh, I think this is one of the problems that I, I always ask myself. Um, as the provinces are not able to ratify, this is not in the uh, Canadian law, what will happen if one province do, does not agree in implementing um, a certain part of the agreement? And in fact, it was a question that I've asked uh, different uh, policymakers from the European side or the Canadian side. And the answer was, well, that's not a situation. That's why I invited everybody on the table at the table of negotiations to come up with, uh, with an outcome that will, uh, you know, be somehow in the middle and will uh, make everybody happy. So I assume we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, a further question, there is a belief that Canada will mostly export its natural resources to the EU and import high quality manufactured goods from the EU. What is your opinion on this? Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm not sure that Canada will export its natural resources to the EU. Uh, one reason for that is the geography, in my opinion. Uh, it was quite a, um, quite, quite a discussion, a debate out there when, when the EU uh, practically recognized what they call the, the dirty oil from the oil sands. Um, and then the debate was, oh, now we will see more uh, exports of, of these uh, uh, natural resources to the, toward the European Union. I don't think that it will happen. Um, Again, geography is one, one thing, costs of, of transportation is another thing, infrastructure and so on. Um, the most important, I mean, if you look at the trade relations that I mentioned before, I didn't mention what are the main products that are exchanged between the two countries. The product and service, first of all, services trade is much more important, explaining the, the trade relation between the two. Uh, so I'll see more services. Uh, in terms of goods, I would see, uh, you know, again, high Manufactured goods and not low quality products, but uh, this will also depend more on uh, how uh, how much uh, the Canadian uh, economy and industry will, will have an, an incentive to diversify and to move a bit from uh, from the resource sector. But from having seeing a large uh, amount of uh, you know natural resources exports to the European Union, my expectation that this is not this is not necessarily. A, a scenario that is uh, is feasible. Do you think that the ending of CETA will open the way to the conclusion of the other agreements presently being negotiated, um, and possibly a future trade agreement with China? Hmm. Um, we are talking about Canadian position or the European uh, Union position. I'm not sure. Uh, from the European uh, Union perspective, I I don't think that CETA necessarily plays an important role on uh, the negotiations with other countries. Uh, I would say that CETA played an important role when you think of the EU-US negotiations. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, in different occasions, uh, having European Union uh, policymakers invited here at different workshops or conferences or meetings, they are clearly mentioning that if CETA is not concluded before they start the negotiations with the US uh, uh, stronger, they will kind of lose interest on, on the Canadian agreement and they will uh, put it aside just because the US is so much more important to the trading partner. So on the other hand, CETA would, uh, in my opinion, can be considered an example uh, for the US-EU negotiations uh, just because the EU has dealt with the same issues here in Canada as they will deal with in, in the US just that the size of the issues are much bigger when we talk about the U.S. market. Um, so if you want the precedent that it creates for those negotiations, this is something that, again, I also mentioned that Canada is kind of in the middle, but something that they had to keep in mind that um, from both sides, EU and Canada, that whatever they, they decide in this, uh, this uh, uh, agreement, uh, they will, uh, you know, it kind of creates a, a precedent with, uh, for the negotiation between the EU and the US. With China, well, um, with China they have um, with China they have investment agreements. 
Opening up a trade agreement with China, I don't think that will happen uh, soon uh, because uh, it will be hard. There are quite a lot of issues that have to be uh, discussed there, and I'm not sure how much uh, there is interest from the Chinese point of view to 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 conclude this kind of agreements with uh, with uh, with Canada. Um, so I would say that in a a closer future, I wouldn't see a trade agreement with China, but who knows later on what, what will happen. The following question is, uh, trade barriers will be abolished. Will the saving be passed to the Canadian consumers? Well, uh, that's, I assume, uh, that's, I assume uh, that, that should be the case. Um, you know, I mean, the cheese market probably is one example uh, where by opening up to, to European cheeses, by having more competition, that should uh, push uh, producers to, to be more uh, competitive. They should put prices to be lower. Uh, so saving uh, eventually, and that's you know that's part of those estimated benefits, savings for consumers. Uh, saving should move towards consumers. Um, we'll see what's happening and how much the competition will, will increase. Uh, overall, what was the effect of the involvement of the Canadian provinces in CETA negotiations? Uh, do you think the provinces will continue to be involved in bilateral agreements? First part of the question, uh, what was the effect of involvement? Well, the effect of involvement, as I give in one point, the example of Alberta and Quebec, uh, the related to agricultural uh, products, was clearly, uh, you know, pushing for their own interest. Newfoundland, that was... Uh, uh, before mentioned in terms of the fish uh, fish product so uh they clearly try to negotiate uh, you know certain things to be limited certain sectors uh, government procurement ontario was clearly uh conflictual about um, um government procurement and how that will affect uh, the the investment in utilities uh, uh, sectors and so on so uh i i think that the provinces were uh, important in the negotiations by uh, pretty much uh, giving the limits that they can uh, go on and they will accept. Because again, as I mentioned in, in one uh, answering in one trying to answer one of the earlier questions, if the provinces are not happy with the, what was, has been concluded, that will create problems in the implementation. And the question is, who will pay the compensation uh, for the European uh, Europeans if they are denied certain market access that has been promised in these agreements. So that's very important to have provinces on the board. Uh, so I think the role of the provinces was to pretty much say, well, this is what we can accept, and we do not go further than that, or try to negotiate with each province. That's why you see, uh, you know, some kind of gov federal government. Uh, um, financial help for the transition period. The second part of the question, do you think the provinces will continue to be involved? Well, I assume it depends on the bilateral agreements. If the agreements are highly comprehensive, like this one, uh, the provinces will have to be in, uh, involved because there are certain issues that are under provinces' uh, um, power, but is not a necessity. Um, uh, it, it's not an, if, if the agreements are more traditional, then the provinces wouldn't uh, have to be uh, involved. In this agreement, it was a clear request from the European Union to have the province uh, table. One, to include everything that they wanted to include it, and two, uh, and this is more of my uh, personal opinion, is to see how it is to have 28 member states uh, involved and uh, in 28 member states uh, expressing their wishes. Uh, and uh, how hard and how dif different it is, rather than having one unitary uh, actor that is uh, um, uh, is involved in the negotiations. Okay, an additional question: Do you think there will be a big impact in which uh, regard investment from both sides? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I hope there will be a big impact. Um, but again, uh, probably at least. At first, I, I would assume that we will, we will see more European investment in the Canadian market. Um, again, the opposite, there will, there will be some changes, in my opinion, that have to happen. And uh, investors, uh, you know, in order to, to gain more, uh, to be more competitive and to, to be able to, um, uh, to be successful in the European market. So um, 
investment benefits, in fact, are one of the largest benefits out of, uh, of uh, you know, what has been estimated there. So opening up the investment market, um, it's been highlighted as uh, being one of the great achievements of, of this, uh, this agreement. So hopefully uh, this will happen. But again, and this is something that, you know, it's, it's something that I always point out and it has to be kept in mind. These benefits are not for granted. Um, and um, uh, it's not only the industry that has to take steps uh, further, uh, but it's also the, the government, the federal government, the provincial government that have to to be involved more and eventually, um, uh, you know, try to increase the, the amount of uh, R&D technological advancement and so on. 